long, long, long time ago in China, there was an emperor who was incredibly rich. He had more treasure than you can possibly imagine. He had many palaces, he had gold, he had jade, he had pearls. But while he was emperor, he wanted more and more and more. And so at his time, the rich got poorer and the poor nearly starved to death. At that time, there was a boy, an orphan, who had no memory of his parents. He survived by gathering the dry twigs in the forest, bundling them up, selling them for firewood, and with a little bit of money, he fed himself. But he had a dream. His dream, his desire in life was to become an artist. That's what he wanted more than anything. He wanted to become a painter. But there's not a chance. He couldn't go to school. In those days, only the boys went to school. And sometimes this boy would watch the boys wealthy enough for school to go to art school. And those boys had long braids down their back. They wore long robes. They carried rolls of rice paper. The paintbrushes were made of ermine fur. They had blocks of ink. And the boy, he dreamt of being like that. But he couldn't. His name was Maline. And sometimes he dared to climb the tree outside the classroom and peer between the branches to listen to the teacher who might say, if you want to paint a stone sharp enough to cut your foot, turn the tip of the brush thus. If you want to paint a river gently flowing, use the brush thus. And Maline was so concentrated on what the teacher was saying, he didn't notice the teacher turn and see him. I do not teach the poor. Marlene, get out of that tree. And he took a string of cash and he threw it out the window and he hit Marlene who fell out of that tree. Bruised and cut. He got up to leave, but the worst pain was the laughter of the boys in the school as they stared at him out the window. Marlene went running. And when he could hear no more laughter, he squatted down to look at his bruises and cuts. And a rooster strutted by. Suddenly, Maline was captured by the shimmer of the rooster's eye, the fold of the comb of the rooster, the spur on the rooster's foot, and the iridescence of the rooster's feathers, and wondered how could any artist ever paint that? And so he forgot his pain, wondering about painting a rooster. The next day, he went out gathering his twigs as ever, and it was a really hot day, so he went to the stream to get some water to drink. And as he scooped up the water, he saw a fish. And you know how a fish just rests? Neither forward nor back, it just rests. And the fish was at rest. And Maline admired the shape of the fish. He wasn't even thinking. He just dipped his finger in the water and drew the outline of the fish on a flat rock and then the fin, and then the gill, and then it all evaporated. But it gave him an idea. He picked up a stick, and he drew the fish in the dirt. And so he studied that fish, and now he had his own tool. Later, he learned that if he burned the tip of a branch, it would make a charcoal that he could draw on a wall. And he practiced his art in every way he could with that stick one stick and then another. He was so skillful that once he drew sheep on a wall and an eagle came down as if to steal the lamb. He wasn't spending as much time gathering twigs and so he didn't have as much money and got hungrier and hungrier. And one day he fell asleep in the middle of the day under a ch blooming cherry tree. And in his sleep he had a dream. There was an old man with a long, thin beard who said, Marlene, you have studied so hard to be an artist. And now I gift you with this brush. And in the dream, Marlene was given the brush. 
This brush has great power, said the old man. You must be careful with its power. When Marlene woke up, he rubbed his eyes and he had the brush. He actually had a brush. He couldn't believe it. And so he went running off to gather as many twigs as he could to sell, not to buy food, but to buy a block of ink and a roll of rice paper. And then he took that ink and the brush and the rice paper to his bit of a hut and he unrolled the rice paper and he dipped his new brush into the block of ink and he painted that fish. Scales, gills, fins. And when the fish was perfect, it swam across the page and fell into a jug of water. Bloop! He couldn't believe it. He tried again. He took the brush and he painted that rooster. Remember the rooster? And when he put the spur on the rooster's foot, the rooster went bleep, 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 and flew off the page. And so Maline used the power of his brush to help the poor people of his village. For the old widow across the road, he painted a flock of ducks. For the man who had plowed the fields with his own back, he painted a pair of oxen. And so soon no one in the village was poor anymore because Maline gave each what each needed. Everything he painted came to life. Well, if that were to happen, the story would spread, don't you think? The story would spread far and wide, and it came to a man named Lin Dai Tzu, who was a powerful man, and he said, I want that boy. I, Lin Dai Tzu. Only one is more powerful than I, the emperor. But if Ma Lin, that boy, comes to me and paints for me an army, the emperor himself will kowtow to me. Bring that boy to me. And so Ma Lin was kidnapped and thrown on the ground in front of Lin Dai Tzu, who said, boy, paint me a living army. Is he going to do it? He remembered the dream, and he just went, I said paint for me an army. I'm Lin Dai Tzu, and you do what I say. And Ma Lin said, no. Then I will lock you in the stable where the horses are meant to live, and I will give you no food, and I'll give you no water, and no heat. You'll be cold, you'll be hungry, you'll be thirsty, and after three days, that brave no of yours will turn to the yes that I deserve. And so Ma Lin was locked in a stable for three days. And when Lin Dai Tzu went down toward the stable, sure that he would get what he wished for, he smelled dumplings. He smelled roast duck. And when he peeked between the boards, there was Maline wrapped in a warm quilt. He had a brazier keeping him warm. He had plenty to eat. He had the brush. He painted whatever he wanted. Lin Dai Tzu, in a rage, began to unlock that stable door when Maline, hearing him, painted a ladder, painted a window, jumped out the window, painted a horse, jumped on the horse, and galloped away. Lin Dai Tzu climbed the ladder, and when his fingers reached for that window ledge, the ladder disappeared underneath his feet, knowing who he was. And there he was left, hanging by his fingernails. But Marlene didn't go home. He knew that that story would always come back to him, and he would be in trouble again. So he went where he was a stranger. <coughs> but he painted, and here's what he learned, very important. <coughs> if he painted a horse, and left off the tiniest detail, perhaps <coughs> eyelashes, the horse would stay on the page. If he painted a duck and left the webbing out of its feet, the duck would stay on the page. And so the people in this new place knew him as an artist. They didn't know about the magic. Now one day, market day, many people, peasants coming and going, selling chickens and pigs and everything that they made, lots of noise, all sorts of soups, cooking and boiling. There was Maline with one huge piece of rice paper spread out, and he was painting a crane, which is a magical bird in China. Long neck, long beak, huge wingspan. And though people were busy and their lives depended on the trade of the day, the beauty that Maline created stopped them in their tracks and they watched him. Beautiful bird. He left off one detail 
the eye. But as he turned from the painting, one drop of ink fell just where the crane's eye should be. And when that happened, the bird flew off the page. It flew around the heads of all of those people who were in silence as they watched it go up and up and up and up. And amongst those were the emperor's guards. And when the emperor saw what had happened, they went to the emperor. They went to the emperor and told him about the boy who painted a crane to life. And the emperor said, "Bring that boy to me. I have always wanted to see a dragon." I've always wanted to see a living phoenix. Bring that boy to me. And so Ma Lin was kidnapped again. And this time he was tied in ropes, thrown into a two-wheeled cart, dragged to the emperor, and again was on the ground. But this time the ground was pure, shimmering stone. And Ma Lin kowtowing to the emperor could see his face reflected back. The emperor said, Marlene, paint for me a dragon. And so Marlene took the brush and he painted a big, fat, warty toad. And the toad went bloop, 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 and knocked over an incredibly uh, valuable vase. Marlene, paint for me a phoenix. And so Marlene took the brush and painted a raging old rooster who went and scratched the emperor on both his cheeks. Marlene, you are going to the dungeon and I will take your brush. And so Marlene was put in the dungeon, but now the emperor had the brush. And the emperor decided to paint for himself. And so he chose the largest wall. And because of his greed, he decided to paint a golden mountain. He painted it higher and higher and higher until the tip of the golden mountain touched the ceiling. But when he was done, the brush, knowing the hand that held it, turned that mountain into gravel that fell tumbling down an avalanche of stone upon the emperor, bruising him, adding to the scratches on his cheeks. He didn't give up. He took the brush to paint a dragon. A dragon is a representation of the Emperor of China. And so he painted a dragon, and it wasn't bad. But it turned into a snake. Imagine that snake curling around the Emperor's ankles, and then his knees and thighs, and up around his belly. And that snake began to curl around his neck to squeeze the life out of him. And he yelled, help, 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 help me, help me. And so the guards came in and chopped that snake into bits. <coughs> Marlene was in the dungeon. The emperor had the brush. But the emperor said, bring that kind boy to me. Bring me that kind boy. And so there was Marlene again. And the emperor changed his tone. Marlene, if you will paint for me what I wish for, you may marry any one of my daughters and have half my kingdom if you will do as I ask. So Marlene took the brush and he painted three fish. The first turquoise with an emerald green eye. The second silver with a ruby eye. The third one golden with a jade eye. And there were those beautiful fish, but they were gasping because they were on the marble floor. The emperor said, Marlene, Marlene, paint for the fish a sea so that they can live. And so Marlene painted a gray green sea and the fish went shh, 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 like lightning through a dark sky. Marlene, Marlene, I must follow the magical fish. Paint for me a ship. And so Marlene painted a ship with three masts and sails that were hanging like limp dishcloths. Marlene, paint for me a wind. I must follow the fish. And Marlene said, did you ask for a wind? Yes, yes, paint for me a wind. And so Marlene painted a wind. And first the sails filled out like a round belly. 
And gently, gently, the ship went out to sea, but Marlene didn't stop. He painted more wind and more wind and more wind until the sea rose up like hammers and smashed that ship. And the wind tore the sails off, and the emperor and all his army sank to the bottom of the sea. The next emperor of China was benevolent. And so the people lived better. Marlene went home to his actual home. And there he painted for the rest of his life. His dream had come true. And the only thing that I know that is left of him is a story that has now gone from me to you. And I hope you tell it to another. <laughs>